My name is Sharon Butler, and I'm secretary of the Early Dance Circle. That means, I suppose, that I help run most events, and I'm a pretty serious amateur historical dancer. And like all historical dancers, I want to get it right. Hence, I come when I can to the Chalamet School, because it offers wonderful background for historical dance including the dancers themselves, but also their music and the costume that you need if you're going to perform them. Here at Chalamet, there is a wonderful costumier, Anne Susan Brown, who helps me create costumes that evoke the period I wish to dance and also are not terribly unflattering. And for most dancers, this is also quite important. <laughs> So it's a place I love coming. Researching historical costume and researching historical dance can pose its difficulties. I tried to use Europeana because I've had a connection to it for some time and I knew that it was a wonderful storehouse of images. But it is an area where it could be more helpful. The dance images are relatively few and not particularly exciting. With respect to costume, it's historically very accurate in what it's depicted, but sadly, some of the costumes are, with the passage of time, rather drab. And particularly Baroque costume was never drab. The colors are stunning, the styles are exciting, the fabrics are slinky and expensive. <laughs> Unless you happen to be a poor servant or uh, a middle-class lady who's desperately trying to ape those further up the social ladder, and then you make do as best you can. And as a historical dancer, I tend to make do as best I can as well. It's a lot of fun, but it's also quite a serious undertaking. What we've been trying to do for some time is begin a project recording what we know now about historical dance and how best perhaps it can be performed within a modern context. And there are many, many ways in which it can be done. So one thing we thought was a good idea was to try to raise its profile, build better general knowledge about, for instance, what exactly Baroque dance is. And the MOOC that we are working on in partnership seemed an ideal way to do this. We envisage it as a free educational resource to begin opening up the huge world of Baroque dance to the general public, but also to professional dancers and serious amateurs who engage in other types of dance. It's an exciting world that's full of variety. I'm Barbara Siegel and I'm a Baroque dancer. I, I perform, I teach, I'm a dance historian. This is our 21st um, summer school and we have Baroque dance, we have early music, singing, mostly Baroque singing, commedia, which is um, which was also very popular in the 18th century uh, at the time that the dancing is done that, that I'm teaching and of course costume making and a lot of people are making Baroque costumes. Uh, in the 16th century uh, dance was really dominated by Italian dancing masters and then at the beginning in early 17th century the French dancing masters developed a slightly different or well, quite a different style uh, this became bell dance, noble dance. In England, it was called French dancing. So it started at the, at the court of Louis XIV in Paris. He loved dancing. Louis had a dancing class every, every day for 20, I think from the age of six to 22, he had a two hour dancing class. He was a bit upset that, um, that a lot of his courtiers couldn't do the dancing as well as he could. So he set up the Royal Academy of Dance in Paris in 1661 to teach the French belle dance. Um, 
the, he, he really wanted the nobles to learn Baroque dance. But unfortunately, well, uh, unfortunately for the nobles and for Louis, he allowed professionals to come in. And professionals were a lower class than the courtiers. And of course, they got so much better than the courtiers that the courtiers stopped dancing. <laughs> so it didn't really um, advance Louis's purposes. But in the 15th and 16th century, there was no turnout of the feet. But in the 17th century, turnout, not the 180 degrees of classical ballet, but, but 90 degrees. Um, it was much higher up, much lighter, much lighter on the feet. But the most important difference, I, I guess, was uh, the use of arms with every step. So if you, if you have a, a sort of du double step, three steps in, in Renaissance times, your arms are here all the time. But in Baroque, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Uh, and and Bar Baroque dance is very closely r related to um, the music because you, you use your arm, you use going up on your toe, but perhaps more significantly your arms to mark the first beat of every, of every bar. So it'll be one, two, three, one, two, three, ooh, ba, ba. <laughs>
and second position, third position, fourth position, and fifth position. But as well as the noble style of French dance, there was also a comic dance done by comedia characters and what they call grotesco characters, which were what we call sort of character roles. And they established the, the five false positions of the feet. So you have false first, false second, false third, false fourth, false fifth, etc. The grotesco dancers were um, very highly trained dancers. The dancing masters often used to do the grotesco mask uh, roles because they were the hardest. It was said that they would spin round on the balls of their toes. So maybe this was the first example of point work with the grotesco characters in um, the early 18th century. They, they say that they, they did pirouettes on the, on the, the ends of their toes. <laughs> and you have the track, this is two dancers, it's a duo, and on the track you have these little lines dividing the track. And what's done in, in that first bar there is done in the first bar of music. So that's how you relate to the two. This, this is the sign for a lady and a man, and the round is their backs. There behind, and so here, here, the, here the little round dot is the, say the heel. That's the sign for the sink. Um, this is a sign for um, a turn. It's clear on this side. So, so you sink, you turn, and then you take a movement, take a step. That shows you the position of the. Um, of the foot at the end of the first step, but it's on the rise, because that's the sign for the rise. This means that these two steps are related, are connected in one step unit. And then in the middle of the second step, you sink and rise all at once. One and two, three. One and two, three. One, two, three. So the men had a lot of freedom. Their costumes were very like ballet tutus that ladies wear today. Um, in the middle of the 17th century, you see a lot of beautiful ladies' costumes. You think they're ladies. And they come out like this, and, and they're knee length. And you might think that the ladies in the 17th century, the professional dancers, wore short skirts, but they didn't. These are all, in the middle of the 17th century in France, all the female roles were still taken by males dancing in female costume. Uh, the females, the professional females, didn't start dancing on the stage uh, until about 1680s, and their, their dresses were really almost floor length. Uh, but then at the beginning of the early 18th century, when the ladies started to do entrechats, they didn't want these entrechats to be hidden beneath their dresses, so they, they shortened their skirts to, to this length here. <laughs> so their footwork could be seen. And I think their costumes must have been fairly light, because uh, when, when they turned around the pirouette, their, their dresses, their skirts, their petticoats could flare out. And the, the dancers in the theatre were ordered to wear knickers, People in general didn't wear knickers at this stage <laughs> because they used to, f to flare out. And of course, caricaturists um, portrayed the dresses flying out so that you could see their legs almost up to their knees. The caricaturists had a field day when ladies started to shorten their skirts. And, and it's said that a lot of the theatre dancers had patrons and, um, and they used to have garters to tie up their to support their stockings, and they would have a garter that identified their patron, and the patrons ordered them to turn fast enough so that their dresses would flare out and that the patron could be identified from the garter. <laughs>
I'm Anne. I'm Anne Brown. I've been coming to Chalamet for about seven years now, six, seven years. And I came because I got to know Barbara from doing a Baroque class. And then she discovered I could actually make some costumes. And she was let down by somebody. So she said, Anne, at the last moment, can you possibly come to Chalamet and help, help people make some costumes for the dance, the early dance? So that's why I'm ended up here. And I've been here, as I say, for about seven years now. And every year is different. And everybody wants to do different periods of costumes. And I am actually a, a jack of all costume periods, a master of none. So basically, I've got my references, and I use these assiduously. And then other people tell me the details about what what and why but then I can go back and read up so I my knowledge is expanding and in actual fact the 1650s it's very difficult to tell you very much about it because not very many of the costumes actually lasted because what happened they were so beautifully designed with black work white work and the braids and things but they got used time and time again so gradually all the fabrics were used up so even the V&A does not have very many um, examples of these things, but the ones that they do, we can see certain shapes of what they look like and all the rest of it, and the embroidery on them. But there are not very many examples to see exactly what they're like. So then we go on a little bit further on. So the 1700s is a much better period to start describing things. So I've got this rather interesting sack back which looks like a sack at the front and the back, which I've never seen any dancers wear because I don't think it's very flattering. But that was where it, it went from very, very tight bodices with big voluminous skirts to something that looked more like a pregnancy smock. That went on to the sack back, which again, the fabrics were so wonderful, they wanted to show it off at the back and they made it well, the sack back, as you know, is, is just one large piece of fabric gathered into a, weight, a, a neckband at the back. And it was just completely loose at the back. But it became tighter and tighter at the front. And then they decided that wasn't very flattering. So then we ended up with the Polonaises because they took the sack back and actually hammered down the back pleats and into a lovely V shape, which of course was very flattering to show your wide shoulders, your little narrow waist, and that emphasized your big childbearing hips. That went on to the big court dresses. Obviously, as people were able to travel, they were able to acquire beautiful, beautiful fabrics. They were heavily embroidered, and what they wanted to see was show people the beautiful fabrics so they made these wonderful court dresses which just were literally out there and it was just a flat piece of fabric with the beautiful embroideries on it totally impractical for everybody else but um, very nice for the court dresses the types of fabrics in the um, early time linens and they were heavily embroidered went into the sat back periods, the early 1700s, 1720s, something like that, you were starting to get the silks and they were damask and they learnt the weaving techniques and you got the lovely, lovely colours. They were very, very bright colours, a lot of them, but they were plain silks with self patterns and all the rest of it. But then we got the, the flouncy things and using, I don't know whether they actually had pinking shears, I don't know that, but a lot of the decoration was just pinked edges. And they applied these on the fronts of the open robes and on the petticoats. And they also used a lot of laces and that sort of thing. When they wanted to dance, they didn't want to trip over their own feet and be, and their dresses trodden on. So of course, they actually raised the level of the hem so you could see their ankles, which was quite unusual for those days anyway. Court dresses, no way, you would only see a pointed toe of a shoe poking out underneath. But the dancers, they had to be raised off the floor quite a lot. And of course that goes on for your um, more working class. They couldn't afford, and it was dangerous as well, to have 
long dresses. They wouldn't want to be sweeping the floors with long trains and that sort of thing. So that they actually, um, they, they had it shorter rather than longer. Well, when the earlier time, they didn't actually attach the sleeves to the bodices. It was only laced. So they were able to raise their arms quite easily. But looking at the sackbacks and all uh, the other, as it, as it progressed, they didn't actually have a very big armhole. That didn't restrict them. That actually made their arm movements a lot, lot better. Because obviously, if you've got a, a, a low armhole, that's going to pull when you try to move your arms, which is why they ended up putting in gussets in some, some clothes. But they didn't have to do that right at the beginning at all, because they literally had the, the arm side was tucked in to the armpit. Because they couldn't afford many dresses, an evening dress had sometimes to be worn during the day. And obviously as it got older, maybe they, they wanted a lovely, lovely new evening dress, so it would be absolutely beautiful. But later on when they worn it a few times maybe, they said, right, okay, we can use this during the day. To make it more modest, they would have what's called a chemisette in, some, uh, um, in later periods, which is a little fill-in. They would also use muslin shawls to cover here, that's called a fichu. And um, that was just literally like a little triangular scarf covering the important bits. The beautiful dresses, the silks, were not really a good idea to hand down to um, working class people, but it was probably handed down to your maid and she would adapt it for her day-to-day -day wear and this sort of thing because they would never wasted anything. Everything was always recycled. But obviously silks wouldn't go well in a kitchen. So they had to have um, a linen interpretation of what the lord or lady of the manor would actually wear. So they wanted to look like their betters. So they would still have corsets. They would still have the peplums and the and the the design as close as they could get to it, but they would use it in fabrics which were like, you know, hard wearing. It all, I've talked about the sack back. The polonaise actually hammered down the pleats to make it more flattering. Ma uh, Marie Antoinette wanted to be a shepherdess, so she raised her skirts and, and ballooned her, the back of the, sack, uh, the, the polonaise up to make it look like a shepherdess. Then suddenly, in the 1790s, it all completely changed and everybody wanted to be like a classical column. 